Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Parallel C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about the basic differences between not blocking and non-blocking algorithms or operations. So there are a number of different ways that we can implement parallel algorithms or operations. And one of the ways that we can classify these different implementations is by whether they're blocking or they're non-blocking. Now, all we really mean by a non-blocking operation or algorithm is that if we were to, say, suspend or cancel uh, one of our threads right, in that uh, program, that wouldn't block the forward progress of our other threads in that application here. So what we're really trying to avoid is this worst case scenario where a thread does something like grab a lock and then you know something happens to it and it gets canceled or killed or maybe it gets put to sleep by the operating system and all of our other threads or at least one other thread um, is blocked because it's unable to get that lock because a thread was put to sleep while still holding the lock. So what we're going to be looking at is a simple example of kind of a blocking and non-blocking case here, right? And we'll see how we can implement these a non-blocking version of this operation using this atomic compare and exchange on the right-hand side of the screen. So let's go ahead and open up first our blocking example. So things are pretty simple here. All we're really going to do is have eight threads work together to complete some problem here. And our problem is just incrementing some sync variable, so this shared value, two to the 15 total times across these eight threads. Now to protect our increments here, uh, we're going to be using a std mutex. So most of our threads will run this normal work function here where in an infinite loop, they try and grab this lock, they check to see if they have more work to do. So if sync is equal to the number of iterations, they'll just go ahead and break out of this loop and return. Otherwise, they'll do an increment here. So they'll do sync is equal to sync plus one. Now, one of our threads is going to run this slow work function in this blocking example. Now, in this slow work function, most of the code is identical. So in an infinite loop, the thread is still going to grab a lock using this lock guard, check to see if there's more work to do, and do this increment. But while holding the lock, what our thread is going to do is sleep for one microsecond here. So this is really kind of showing off, you know, one of the downsides of blocking algorithms here. So when we go ahead and put this slow thread to sleep, we're putting it to sleep while holding this mutex here. That means none of our other threads, or seven other threads in this case, running this normal work function, will be able to make forward progress here, right, and increment this sync value, because they'll all be waiting for this mutex to become free. But this mutex is being held by our slow thread, which we just put to sleep here. So we'll see how this can imp you know, drastically imp uh, impact our performance. Okay, so the rest of our code is pretty simple. We're just gonna spawn our eight threads. So seven of our threads will run this work function, and then one of our threads will run this slow work. Then we'll just wait for our threads to complete by joining them. And then finally, we'll just print out the final value of sync, which should just be two to the 15 or 32768. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can implement this in a non-blocking way. So we're not subject to this, uh, this problem where we can put a thread to sleep using a lock. And we'll see how we can implement this using this atomic compare and exchange. Okay, so we have the same kind of problem set up. So two to the 15 total iterations across eight threads. But what we've done is we've changed sync to now be this atomic integer here. So we can do this atomic compare and exchange. So let's see how we've changed our work function. So we're still going to have this infinite loop here, this while true, so while we still have work to do. But the two main values that we're going to be working with inside of this loop are going to be this desired and expected. So desired is going to be um, what we want to update the value of sync to, and expected is going to be the current value of sync that we're going to load from this atomic. So inside of this do while loop, right, what we're going to do is check to see if we have more work to do. So if expected is equal to the total number of iterations, we'll just return, that means we're out of work. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and add one to expected here, right? And set desired equal to that result, right? So this is our increment here. We want to update the value we loaded from sync by one, and we're going to store that in desired. Then we're going to actually try and update our shared value of sync here. And we're going to do that using this atomic compare and exchange. So what exactly does this atomic compare and exchange do? So we can see on the right-hand side of the screen from CPP reference that it atomically compares the value of this, which is going to be sync in this case. It's comparing the value of sync with that of expected. So we're making sure that 
the value that we initially loaded for sync is the same as the current value of sync so that no other thread kind of came in in between these two operations and updated this value, right? So we're making sure that, you know, the value of sync and expected is the same. If they're equal, so, you know, if they're bitwise equal, we're going to replace sync with the value of desired here. So in this case, right, if expected is the same as the current value of sync, we'll just replace the value of sync with desired and we'll continue with the next iteration of this outer loop here. Now, if we find that the value of expected and the value of sync are different, so that's the case where we loaded a value from sync, but then some other thread updated sync while we were still in the middle of this loop, we found that it was different than expected um, when we tried to do this, uh, this atomic compare and exchange, we see that this operation will load the current value of sync into expected. So it'll automatically update expected if this compare and exchange failed. And then we'll just go through another iteration of this inner do while loop, trying to, you know, first see if we have more work to do, update desired, and then we'll do the compare and exchange again with this updated desired value here. So that's really all we're doing here, right? If we find expected and sync are the same, the compare and exchange goes through. If we find that they're different, um, we just update expected and try this do while loop again, right? So that's how we're going to implement this non-blocking version of this operation here. And the reason why it's non-blocking is that uh, this thread is not going to block the execution of any of our other threads here. None of our other threads are relying on what this thread is doing. Okay, so that's going to be our normal work function, but we're still gonna have a slow work function that one of our threads is going to run. So it essentially does the exact same thing internally here, but every iteration that we do an increment will also put this thread to sleep for one microsecond here. But because like I said, this is non blocking and none of our other threads are relying on this result. So they can kind of work on this problem independently of this slow thread. Um, this, uh, you know, sleep for one microsecond shouldn't have, you know, a large or really any impact on our total execution time. Okay. So the rest of our code is identical to our blocking example. We just spawn our eight threads, seven with this normal work function, and then one with the slow work function that sleeps for one microsecond, uh, you know, every time we do an increment. And then we wait for the threads to complete and print out the final value of sync, which should be two to the 15 or 32768. Okay, so let's go ahead and quit out of here and we can compile uh, these two examples here. So we'll compile both blocking and non-blocking and we'll compile them with the exact same uh, compiler flags. So O3 optimizations, uh, standard is equal to C++20 and linking against libp thread for both. So let's go ahead and compare the execution time uh, of these two different operations here. So first we'll time blocking. And what we see is it actually takes quite a while to just do these 32K total iterations here. And that's because we have this case where a slow thread can drag down the performance of all of our other threads. So when that one thread goes to sleep for one microsecond while holding the lock, none of our other you know, seven threads are able to do anything. They're just sitting there waiting for access to that lock. So to do just you know, 32K increments of a single number here, it ends up taking us somewhere between 1.4 and 1.6 seconds, right? Which isn't great. So let's go ahead and compare that to our non-blocking implementation. So we can go ahead and time this uh, one non-blocking and we see something you know very nice and maybe somewhat surprising. And that's that it completes almost immediately, right? So it only takes you know somewhere on the order of 0.003 or 0.004 total seconds here. And we get the same result of 32768, right? So what exactly is going on here? Why is there such a huge performance difference? Well, really we're only doing 32768 total increments of a number here that shouldn't take a whole lot of time here. And because in our non-blocking case, we're not serialized on that sleep for one microsecond, our seven threads are basically just paying the cost of moving the, that cache line around due to cache coherence between our different cores and our different threads that are performing these writes here, right? And even though we have all of those cache misses and that cache line bouncing around, it's still only 32K total uh, iterations of that loop. It shouldn't take that long. 
But in the case of our blocking example here, we have a thread going to sleep for an entire microsecond and blocking all seven of our other threads um, from doing anything during that time. In the case of our non-blocking example, we can have one slow thread, but our other seven fast threads are not blocked by that slow thread. They're able to continue doing their work as normal. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of this blocking versus non-blocking implementation. So it can be really useful and have a lot of great performance impacts. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the underlying assembly for this blocking, um, or rather this non-blocking implementation. So we can do that by just doing perf record on this non-blocking. And then we can go ahead and do perf report and we'll go ahead and open up this thread, right? So what we see here is, you know, roughly what we saw, um, you know, at a high level in C++. So the first thing that we're really doing is this load, right? So we're just loading the value of sync here and we're comparing it against our, you know, this value of 32768. So we're seeing if we have more work to do. If we don't have more work to do, we just go ahead and return here. If we do have more work to do, this is where we do our increment. So we're using this LEA or load effective address instruction to do our increment, right, of our desired value here. Um, or rather of our expected value to get our desired value. And then we try to do this atomic compare and exchange. So we have this lock prefix and we're doing this compare and exchange, trying to update um, sync with this desired value so long as our current value um, you know, hasn't been kind of updated in between uh, you know, when we loaded sync right, and when we're doing this exchange. Right? If we find that you know, this completed successfully, we just go back up to the top do another load right of sync, and this whole process starts over again. If we found this compare and exchange failed, we go back through this kind of inner do while loop where we make sure that you know we still have more work to do. We make a new desired value here, and we do the compare and exchange again. So that's really what's going on underneath the hood. Okay, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for this time. Brief introduction to uh, blocking versus non-blocking operations or um, algorithms. I'll go ahead and link below this video, uh, the CPP reference page for compare and exchange. And then of course you can find this or any of my other examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick and I hope you have a nice day.